Hello everyone and welcome back to our second thermo video. Again, sort of a prep lecture getting us ready for the class. Now, in this second lecture, we're going to talk more about definitions and terminology so that we understand the material that we're going to start studying in class. Now, this is a concept that I'm sure you've been introduced to before. Maybe you've done in physics a problem like this where you have someone on a swing that's converting gravitational potential energy or height into kinetic energy or velocity. So it's the same concept in thermodynamics, except we're going to talk about a broader set of energies that we can be transferring back and forth between. I talked in the last class how we're going to learn about how mass has energy that's associated with it. And some of that is chemical energy. Some of that's going to be thermal energy. And we're going to look at how all that energy gets stored inside the mass and how it changes when we do things like boil water. And then we're going to learn how we can sort of harness those energy changes to drive things like turbines and generate power in things like a nuclear power plant. Now, before we do that, we have to take a step back. And I think in the very first communication that I gave you at the beginning of this class, and even in the last video, we talked about trying to understand the universe, right? And to do that, we need to know what we mean by a system. So a system is whatever small part of the universe or large part of the universe that we're interested in studying. Right now, everything that is not part of the system will be part of the surroundings. So our very basic schematic or drawing of the universe will look like this, where we have a system, that's the stuff that we're interested in, and the rest of the universe here in blue, that's the surroundings, right? So we bisected the universe into basically things we're interested in and things that we're less interested in. So what can the system do? So the system and the surroundings can communicate or interact with each other. Now they interact with each other across some boundary. Now that boundary can be physical, like a wall, or it can just be imaginary, right? So it's sort of some imaginary line that we think, okay, once we cross that imaginary line, we've left the system and we're now part of the surroundings. And sometimes this boundary can move or change with time. So it's not limited to be whatever shape it was at the beginning of our analysis. The shape of this system can change with time. Now, in thermodynamics, we got to start thinking about what we have inside of our system and what we have uh, sort of outside of our system in the surroundings, right? And it helps to think about how we're going to define these things, right? So we need to understand that in this class, we will be defining things from a macroscopic perspective. So that means think about the room that you're in. Now, most of the room that you're in will be s filled with air, right? And we're going to treat that air and really any substance as a continuum, right? So what does that mean? It means that we're not going to be taking into account the individual interactions that are happening between molecules in the air, right? So at any particular point inside of our system, we're going to assume that all of the properties inside of our system are the same. So we're going to say, oh, the temperature at some point of interest is all going to be the same, right? So it's kind of like we're averaging over a relatively large number of molecules, right? So we're going to think about average properties, right? So sometimes this is called the classical view of thermodynamics because it's not sort of dealing with these intermolecular interactions, right? So this is the view that we'll adopt in this course. It's important to know the difference in the definitions, but we will always be solving problems from the macroscopic perspective or the classical view of thermodynamics.
But, you know, it is important to know that there's a different view of thermodynamics that we call the microscopic perspective, right? So now in the microscopic perspective, we start to think about individual molecules and how they interact with each other. So sometimes if you're thinking about doing this on a computer, you might be talking about molecular dynamic simulations. When you're thinking about how individual molecules are actually interacting and what are those forces that are sort of pushing and pulling individual molecules and how do they behave. So this is sometimes called the statistical view of thermodynamics. And it is required for some practical applications. So if you have rarefied gases, um, you're, if you're talking about events in the upper atmosphere, sort of my own area of research, although is more microscopic, where we can still use the continuum approximation for liquids, maybe not gases. Um, so here, when we talk about nanoscale systems, so that's like a thousand times smaller than a micrometer is a nanometer, right? So when things get really, really small, if you're pushing air through a very, very small channel, if there's only, uh, if that channel is really only big enough for one molecule to go through at a time, then you probably have to track individual molecules as they move through the channel. So that's when you might get into this kind of microscopic view of thermodynamics, right? So this is sometimes called modern thermodynamics, or like we said before, statistical thermodynamics. This is the kind of analysis that you cannot do with a pencil and a paper. Here you need pretty powerful computers to be doing these kind of molecular dynamic simulations. And then you would only get, you know, after sort of very intensive computer calculations, you'd only get very small time sequences of what's going on inside your system, right? So this, aside from knowing the definition, this is beyond the scope of the course, right? So just from a sort of pictorial view, right? So if we were aliens in space and we were looking down at a large gathering like this, you know, the aliens might think, oh, all those humans are the same. So I can just take their average properties, right? So maybe they, they all look like they're about the same height, right? They all look like they're about the same size. So they have kind of average properties. But as humans here on Earth, we know that, that we're individuals, right? And individuals have a host of differences that make our own experience unique, right? So that's more the macroscopic perspective. But in this course, we will treat all systems from a macroscopic perspective. Right, so we talked about dividing the universe into a system in the surroundings, right? So we have different types of systems that we can look at, right? So the first system is called a closed system, or sometimes in the textbook, they'll call this a control mass, right? So a closed system, it's closed because mass can't come in or out. So it has a fixed quantity of mass. The amount of stuff inside it isn't changing, although the shape can be changing, right? So the volume is not necessarily, not necessarily constant, even though the mass is, right? And even though we can't transfer mass into or out of our system, we could transfer energy. So if we had, say, let's say you had um, a pot, Right? And it had a lid on it that was sealed very, very well, but you'd already boiled some water in there and now you left it on your stovetop. So it's a closed system because the water and the steam, whatever mixture you have in the pot, can't escape to the surroundings. But over time, that pot will cool down. So it is transferring energy to the air in your kitchen. Right, Another example might be this piston cylinder assembly here. When the intake and exhaust valves are closed, this is probably pretty close to a closed system, although gas might still be able to escape along the walls of your piston, particularly if you've got um, poor gaskets or a poorly designed system. So when we think about closed systems, there's a very specific type of closed system called an isolated system. This isolated system is a special case where not only does the system not transfer mass between the system and the surroundings, but it does not interact in any way with the surroundings. So if we think back about that pot that's sitting on your stovetop, 
you would then kind of perfectly insulate that pot so that heat can't escape from the pot to the surround. So another type of system, and I guess the opposite of a closed system, is an open system. So when our closed system could not transfer mass between the system and the surroundings, an open system can. Now we'll often call open systems control volumes. Now here, these volumes have at least one porous or open boundary on the control surface so that mass is able to move into and potentially out of our system. The system surface is enclosed and it's called a control volume. So an example of a control volume might be the engine in your car, even though at some moments in time the piston itself could be thought of as a closed system, the engine itself has an air intake and it also has an exhaust. So air is coming into the engine and it's going out of the engine. Fuel is also coming into the system. So mass is transferring into and out of this system. So now when we start to think about what's going on inside of our system, it's helpful because we want to know how much energy is inside of our system at a given moment, right? And how much energy is being transferred into and out of our system. So to do that, we have to understand properties of our system. So a property is a macroscopic characteristic. So it's a characteristic that we're averaging across a series of molecules inside of our system. And it's done at a particular instant in time. So if that pot that I have on my kitchen stove is sealed and I have at some time, which I'm going to call time zero, it's I've boiled some of the water. So inside of my system, it has a temperature and it has a pressure. Right? But over time, those things might change, particularly as my pot is cooling back down. Right, So the properties are not dependent on the time history of the system. So in thermodynamics, a lot of times when we're talking about defining properties, we don't care how the system got to a particular temperature or a particular pressure. We just care that at a particular instant or at a particular position in space, we're measuring a property. So this property describes one characteristic of the system, whether it's temperature or pressure or density or mass. It describes one thing about my system. Now, there's different types of properties. So the first type of property we're going to talk about is an extensive property. Now, extensive properties depend on how much matter or mass is present in the substance or in the system. So one example of an extensive property is mass. So the mass on this barbell will change depending on how many plates I put on the barbell. The mass will increase if I put another plate on the barbell. An intensive property is the opposite of an extensive property and it does not depend on the quantity of matter present in the substance. So if we think about that barbell, if I put another plate on, provided it's from the same manufacturer um, and the you know quality of manufacturing is good, the mass might increase, but the density of the plate doesn't change no matter how big the plate is, provided it's manufactured in the same way. Or if you think about the air in your room that you're listening to this video in, as long as the temperature is constant, right, it doesn't matter. The mass of the air is going to be different if we look at the whole room versus half of the room. But the density of the air or the temperature of the air is not going to change if I only look at the whole room or half of the room. So an example for, for an intensive property is temperature. Because the temperature of the air in the room doesn't change depending on how much of the air I'm looking at. So the next question is, what is a state? 
right? Now, this is not the kind of state that we're talking about, although periodically I like to update this picture, right? With the blue states are the states that I've uh, traveled to. And I usually like to define travel to as slept there at least one night. So if I transfer through an airline, an airport in a particular state, that doesn't count, right? So it was very nice. I had the opportunity with my family to go to Hawaii a couple years ago, right? So it was fun to turn that state blue on this map. But this is not the kind of state that we're talking about in thermodynamics. So in thermodynamics, we're going to spend a lot of time trying to define a state of our system, right? Now, this is also sometimes called fixing a state. And when we know the state or when we have fixed the state, that's when we know all of the properties of the substance, right? Or at least all of those properties could be looked up in a textbook, right? And we want to be able to fix a state because we want to know how much energy the mass or the uh, sort of the mass inside of our system has. Right. And we can do that once we know all the properties of the mass in our system, then we will know how much energy it has. We'll talk about this as we move on. But in order to fix a state, we need to know two independent intensive properties. Right? And as we talk about fixing states, we'll learn how we go about doing that for different um, types of matter. So there's some more definitions that we have here right so we talked about a state right so then it's important for us to define thermodynamically what we mean by a process so a process is something that happens that causes the system that we have to move from one state to another so if we think again about our closed system right so this pot that i have that's sealed on my uh, stove top when I turn on the element and I start to heat up that, um, so maybe I, I put water in my tap, it comes out at about four degrees Celsius, and I bring it just about to boiling, which happens at about 100 degrees Celsius, depending on what the atmospheric pressure is, right? Then the process of heating that up, of moving from one temperature to another temperature, uh, that's what we mean by a process. So we might have two states right? And there's lots of different paths that we can take between two states. And this is kind of the beauty of the engineering, right? So we can, we can go between any two states with lots of different processes, right? So if you're thinking about a car engine, right? Uh, your inlet air has a particular temperature and pressure that's just governed by mother nature, right? Now, your exhaust conditions might be governed by whatever state regulations there are, right? Or maybe federal regulations. So you as an engineer, you get to decide or design a device that moves through a particular set of processes to go from one, your inlet state to your outlet state. And the path that you take between those two states will determine how much power your car generates Right? how much fuel your car burns, right? and sort of how efficient your engine is. So in thermodynamics, we'll spend a lot of time drawing processes out. right? And one of the tools that we'll use to do that, it's not the only way we'll graph things, but this is a curve that we'll call a PV diagram that has volume on the x-axis here and pressure on the y-axis. So here we're drawing out a process. So this might be something as you're moving through uh, an auto engine, right? And how does the pressure and the volume change inside your cylinder as that piston is moving up and down? So a lot of times we like to visually display these processes on graphs like pressure versus volume graphs. So now we've talked a lot about systems, right? But what are you gonna put inside of your system? So one of the options that you have is a fluid, right? We'll talk a lot about fluids in this, in this class. We'll talk a lot about water, right? I talked about in the last video how, you know, you sort of give a mechanical engineer heat, and a lot of times what we want to do is boil water with it, right? So one of the things we can put inside of our system is fluids, right? Which you'll learn about a lot in fluids class, right? 
Now, what you might not know is that the formal definition of a fluid is that it's a substance that continuously deforms under shear stress. So maybe in in the static class, you know, or if you think about like a diving board, if you, uh, you know, you go into a pool, now you apply a shear stress on that diving board and it deforms a little bit. Hopefully it's only in elastic deformation and then it bounces back to, you know, it tries to bounce back to its original shape, right? And depending, you know, the system is probably um, under damped, right? So it's going to, you know, rebound past the system and, you know, bounce back and forth and eventually get back to its initial position, right? But fluids don't do that. If you put your hand in the bathtub, right, and the bathtub's full of water, and you move your hand through, you'll move those fluid elements around, and there's no force that's pulling them back to their original positions, right? So they're continuously deforming under shear stress, right? So examples of fluids, I think, well, probably we'd all would have guessed this, um, liquids, things like liquid water, or gases like steam or air. Solids, I think we're maybe a little bit more familiar with. So this is a picture of an actuator. It's two different metals. And when you apply a voltage to them, you get different expansions in the different metals so that uh, this sort of cantilever beam will either bend one way or bend the other way, depending on the voltage that you apply. Right, so you can have a solid in your system and that's a system that can deform under shear stress, but not continually. So now, we want to talk about how much energy is in our system. So, you know, it's important for us to think about all the different ways that we can have energy in the system, right? So what are some different properties that we might be interested in? So one is speed. Speed is a scalar property, right? So it tells you the change in position over time, but it's not concerned with direction, right? So it's the magnitude of a velocity vector. Right? And it might be in SI units, maybe in meters per second or kilometers per hour. And in uh, imperial measurements, it's maybe feet per second or miles per hour. You might have acceleration. Couldn't get a good picture for acceleration, but this one, you know, the background's blurred. So it must be, must be changing speed, right? Um, so this is how fast your speed is changing with time, right? The magnitude of acceleration is a scalar property. Right? And in SI units, this would be meters per second squared. And in imperial units, this would be feet per second squared, providing that you're not talking about GC, which is that characteristic gravitational acceleration. And then we have to put in some extra units to change that mass back into a force. Speaking of forces, forces are other things that we might want to be able to, de to define. Right? So the force is the capability or the capacity to do work or cause physical change. So you have a force, that means you could lift something up in a gravitational field. Right? So you could do work. Right? From Newton's second law, we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Right? And we talked about how that might change in imperial units. We might talk about work. Work is... Uh, Energy that's, be, that's, you know, a process that does work is producing or consuming energy. So this is the application of a force over distance. So somebody pushing a library cart, like shown down here, right? And although force and distance are both vectors, work is a scalar property. Energy does not have a direction. So here work is force times distance. We have a unit for work called joules in the SI system. A joule is a Newton meter. It's important to know that when you're doing unit analysis, but it's also a kilogram meters squared per second squared, right? So here, if we use uh, Newton's second law, we can change that Newton's into something that has kilograms in it, just in case we need to cancel out some kilograms. In imperial units, work might be a foot pound, that's a nice name for a unit because it tells you exactly what work is, right? It's a force times a distance, or in this case, a distance times a force, right? A foot times a pound, right? Now, one of the reasons that you'll probably come to dislike imperial units, if you don't dislike them already, is that the conversions are really weird. So you can have foot pounds here, right? So one foot pound is one foot pound force, 
right? But sometimes in imperial units, we'll talk about work in terms of British thermal units or BTUs. Maybe you're familiar with this if you've ever purchased a window air conditioner, right? And one foot pound force is obviously equal to 1.2851 times 10 to the negative three BTUs. And this is why you'll probably end up loving SI units because things when you're converting between things that are units for the same thing, right? Like a joule to a kilojoule to a megajoule, you're always multiplying by some factor of a thousand. Power is something else that's going to be very important to us in this class. So power is work over a period of time. So it's kind of the rate at which you're doing work, right? So if two people are lifting the same amount of weight up the steps, but one person is doing it faster, they're doing the same amount of work, but one person is doing it at a higher rate of power. So power is work over time. In SI units, this would be joules per second or watts. Watts are also kilogram meter squared per seconds to the power of three or cubed. In SI units, power is often in horsepower, right? So one horsepower, right? We can have 550 foot pounds per second or 2,545 BTUs per hour. Mass is something else that we might want to describe in our system. So the mass is kind of how much stuff you have, right? So mass is an extensive property, right? And in SI units, mass is in kilograms or maybe grams. But in imperial units, this is typically in pound mass, right? Sometimes, although not in this class, usually we'll use pounds mass, but you can also, if you want to have different units for mass and force in the imperial system, you could also use slugs. Another property we might be interested in is density. So density is defined as the mass per unit volume, right? So if you think about density, Right? This is the limit as your volume gets really, really, really small of mass that fits in that volume. Right, So now in uh, SI units, we measure density in kilograms per meter cubed. And in imperial units, we typically define this as pounds mass per cubic foot. Right, So this is an intensive property. So if you think about we had mass which was an extensive property, this is kind of a way to think about the mass in an intensive way. If we say how much mass is in a particular unit of volume. Now, in thermodynamics, we'll actually not talk about density very much because we'll sort of adopt this process of turning an extensive property, one that depends on mass, into an intensive property, one that doesn't depend on mass. And the way that we'll do that is we'll take the extensive property and divide it by mass, right? So our specific volume, so volume by itself is an extensive property because the volume changes depending on how much stuff you have, right? Because it's kind of a, ma uh, a measure of how big your thing is, right? But if you take the volume and divide by the mass, now your specific volume is independent of mass, right? So we'll use this trick not just for volume, but for several other properties which might be extensive, and we'll divide them by mass, right? So when we do that, we'll say specific something, right? So specific means divided by mass. I guess the other place you may have heard of this is the specific heat for a particular material, and that's the amount of energy you have to put in to one kilogram of your material to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius or one degree Kelvin, right? So there it's specific heat because it's the amount of heat per unit mass, right? So anytime we put specific in front of an extensive variable name, we make it intensive and we divide by mass. We'll also adopt the sort of process 
of using a capital letter to define the extensive property and a lowercase letter to define the intensive property or the specific property. So volume we will denote with a capital V, but specific volume we'll denote with a lowercase v. Right? So when we divide by mass, we make a property intensive. Right? And now here my v, I've, cr I've put a cross through it, right? And that means that we're taking um, the big V volume and dividing by mass, and that gives a little v specific volume. So this would be meters cubed per kilogram. This is the inverse of density, or cubic feet per pound mass. Temperature is another property that we're interested in. Temperature is some measure of the intensity of heat or thermal energy that's present in a substance. Right? Temperature really only makes sense when you're talking about it relative to something else. Right? So um, if you're saying it's hot or it's cold, it usually means uh, maybe hot or cold compared to something, maybe to your body temperature, if you're thinking about whether or not something is uh, feels hot or cold. Right? So there are two common scales for measuring temperature, right? Two in SI units and two in imperial units. So I guess there's a total of four different scales for measuring temperature that we'll use in this class. So in SI units, if you're using Kelvin or Celsius, if you think about a thermometer that has different lines on it, the spacing between the lines, when it, whether it's Kelvin or Celsius, will be the same distance apart, right? So if you're talking about the change in temperature, it'll be the same in Kelvin or Celsius. The difference is you have a different reference point. So the reference point for Celsius is the freezing temperature of water. And the reference point for Kelvin is absolute zero. So in imperial measurements, we have Fahrenheit and we have Rankin, right? So again, just like uh, Celsius, Celsius and Kelvin, um, the lines on your thermometer are the same distance apart for, Ral for Rankin and Fahrenheit, right? So a temperature change in Fahrenheit is the same as a temperature change in Rankin. And again, the difference is the reference temperature or the zero value. So for Fahrenheit, I don't know why they pick zero Fahrenheit to be zero Fahrenheit, um, I've read somewhere online that it's the um, freezing point of some specific type of brine, right? Some mixture of salt water, uh, salt and water, right? But Rankin, like Calvin, has a zero point of absolute zero, where we think all molecules will stop moving. Another unit that we're very interested in in this class is pressure, right? So here I got a picture of a pressure cooker. Um, this is a great way to make oats, particularly, I guess, if you live in high altitude because um, you actually can't boil some things. Like if you're trying to boil beans or maybe uh, oatmeal as well, if the pressure is too low, then uh, you can't actually get the water to boil. Or it, actually, the water will boil, but it'll boil at a temperature that's lower than the temperature you need to cook your beans, right? So pressure is force applied over an area, right? So there's all kinds of different units for pressure, right? And this is, we'll talk a little bit more about pressure to the end of this lecture, right? But in SI units, typically we'll talk about pascals or kilopascals or megapascals. And this is force over area. So it's newtons per meter squared or kilogram meters per meter squared second squared or kilograms per meter second squared right? Um, for imperial units, we might talk about pounds per square foot, PSF, right? Which could be slug feet per feet squared, second squared, or slugs per feet second squared, right? Um, but I guess typically, at least when you're thinking about inflating a, you know, a car tire or a bike tire, you'll think about pounds per square inch or PSI, right? Which has the units that are shown here. But the thing about pressure is it's, it's, it's basically a type of potential energy, right? Because if you think about um, your car tire or your bike tire, if you puncture a hole in it, right, or maybe it's a little safer to just open that valve a little bit, what happens is um, 
this pressure, which is a potential energy, gets converted into kinetic energy because that air starts to rush out the valve stem, right? So in fluids, um, there's other types of pressures that we might talk about, right? So we might talk about a fluid or a static pressure, velocity pressure, which is called dynamic pressure or stagnation pressure. You don't really have to worry about these things, uh, I guess, two and three in this class. That's more of a fluid mechanics type thing. Right. So we'll be interested in static pressure. Right. Or fluid pressure. Right. So this is the kind of thing I don't know if you've ever seen a manometer, but if you think about um, this is basically just like a straw. Right. And if you had a straw and it was filled with water, if the pressure is if these tubes are just open to the atmosphere on both sides. But now if you blow in a little bit at P2, so you increase the pressure here, you'll push this fluid down. And then, you know, based on the force that's pushing down, right, the weight of this extra fluid that's above this level here, you'll get some distance in height. And if you measure that height, you can back out the pressure. Now, we've sort of moved away from manometers in digital devices, maybe using pressure gauges that are something like this, where we have a diaphragm between sort of two orifices, right? And we have two pressures that are coming in here. And then basically how this deforms will change the electrical signal that's that's running across that diaphragm. And then we can measure basically the deformation and we can associate that with a pressure difference between our two orifices. Pressure is a little bit like temperature where it really matters only in the sense of one pressure versus another pressure. Right. So when we're talking about pressure, it's always relative to something. Right. So we can have absolute or uh, static pressures. Right. So absolute pressures are relative to uh, a vacuum. Right. So to sort of a volume with nothing in it. Right. So that's space. Right. So on Earth, it's a little hard to measure that because you can't sort of um, carry around, you know, a volume with nothing in it. Right. So instead, we often will use atmospheric pressure. So that's the difference in pressure basically in your bike tire versus whatever the air pressure is in the air that's, you know, adjacent to your bike tire. But when we're we're going to use tables a lot in this class uh, to fix states and usually the pressure that's on those tables is the absolute pressure. Right. The other kind of pressure that we are uh, that you're probably more familiar with, honestly, is gauge pressure. Right. And gauge pressure tells you uh, sort of the pressure that you'd measure on a pressure gauge where you're comparing the pressure maybe inside your bike tire to the pressure in the air that's outside your bike tire. Right. So that's the pressure that you're reading off your pressure gauge. So that's kind of a relative pressure instead of an absolute pressure. So if we think about temperatures, this absolute pressure is kind of like an absolute temperature. Right. It's comparing the pressure that you have versus the lowest possible pressure. Right. And this is comparing the pressure that you have versus some other pressure that's convenient to measure. So depending on the industry that you're in or the application that you're talking about, uh, you're probably going to deal with a lot of different units for pressure. So we have to be pretty confident changing between different pressure units. Right. So here's some quick examples. Right, so a bicycle tire is pumped up to 65 pounds per square inch. What is the pressure in pascals? Right, so here's just a couple quick equations, a couple quick examples to kind of show how you do unit analysis, but also to get us used to changing units for pressure. Right, so if I have pounds per square inch, right, so I have 65 psi, and then I get a conversion rate. And this conversion rate is that there are about 6,895 pascals per PSI. So now when I do this, right, I can cancel out the pounds per square inch over here with the pounds per square inch in the denominator over here. And now I'm left with an answer just in pascals, right? But my pascals, I mean, this is kind of a big number to say that it's, you know, 448,162 pascals. Right. So instead, we then divide by a thousand because it's the metric system and it makes sense. And we can go from, you know, 448,000 pascals to approximately 450 kilopascals. Right. Because we divided by a thousand. 
Now, do we think that this would be in gauge pressure or in absolute pressure? Now, the odds are that when we measured this, we were measuring this with some kind of a pressure gauge. So ooh, this would be probably measured in gauge pressure. So versus the, the pressure in the atmosphere beside the tire. So you, uh, you're watching the news. And the news says that the barometric pressure will drop to 14.4 pounds per square inch. What is the pressure in pascals? Right? So here we do the same analysis. Right? We're still multiplying by the same conversion factor. We're still doing the same unit conversion, right? We're still canceling out those PSI, right? And we get 99 point or 99,285 pascals or 99.3 kilopascals, right? Atmospheric pressure is usually about 101.3 kilopascals. So this is the pressure is dropping. And if I was a, a weather person, then, you know, I might be able to tell you that that has some correlation to what the weather might be where you are right so here we can see is this gauge pressure or is this absolute pressure right and i guess the hint that i'm giving you is that atmospheric pressure is approximately 14.7 psi absolute right so here right if we're talking about the pressure being 14.4 psi this is going to be absolute pressure Right, because if it was gauge pressure, it would actually be minus 0.3 psi. Right, unless we thought the pressure was going to be twice whatever the atmospheric pressure is. Right, so it's important to think about what type of units we're getting our pressures in. Here's another example: ambient air is compressed into a storage tank to a pressure of 5.2 bar, and it tells us this is gauge pressure. So you might be thinking, what the heck is a bar? right? But one bar, because it's sort of weird, sometimes we talk about um, pressure in terms of atmospheres, so that's like how, what the multiple of atmospheres are. But in metric, we really want sort of nice round units. So atmospheric pressure, like I said, is typically about 101.3 kilopascals. So instead, we made up this other unit called bar, and a bar is 100 kilopascals, or 10 to the 5 pascals. So if we want to convert bar into pascals, we multiply by 10 to the power of 5. Right? So now my bar counts cancel, and I'm left with 5.2 times 10 to the 5 pascals, or 0.5 megapascals. The pressure on the hull of a submarine is given as 10 atmospheres. What is the pressure in SI units? So 10 atmospheres, right? So I have 10 atmospheres and I know that every atmosphere is 1.013 bar or if I wanted 101.3 kilopascals per atmosphere, right? So here my um, atmospheres are going to cancel, right? So this is basically saying the same thing. So, for, so we take... We converted this into bar first and then into pascals. You could go directly into pascals if you wanted to or kilopascals. But again, I'm trying to show you how you carry units through in your calculations. Right? So here my atmospheres cancel, my bars cancel, and I'm left with an answer in pascals, which is good because I want pressure, right? So if I was left with something like pascal meters, then I'd know that I messed up somewhere. Right? So in this case, um, I get... 1,013,000 pascals, or about one megapascal. So do we think this would be gauge pressure or absolute pressure? Right, so personally, I think this would probably be a gauge pressure because we would be sort of comparing to the atmospheric pressure inside the submarine, right? Although in this case, Maybe it doesn't matter too much because the, uh, the atmospheric pressure starts to be pretty low compared to the, the pressure that we're talking about here, right? So that'd be an extra 0.1 megapascals, right? So it's still, uh, you know, it's up for some debate. But you can see how it could be important. You could be talking about the difference between, you know, failure in the integrity of your hull versus not failure, right? So that'd be pretty important, um, you know, when you're designing a submarine.
So that ends the second prep lecture. Hopefully you're starting to get a bit of a feeling for what the definition of all these terms are. So I'll see you again next time. Thank you for joining me.